Hello, good morning and welcome to Newsfile. This is your most authoritative news analysis platform. And as you know here on Newsfile, we put Ghana first. Today, we have a whole three hours dedicated to asking a number of questions, including why the public university bill? Why at all is it needed? The stakeholders who are against it in the universities have described it as backward, retrogressive, unconstitutional, illegal, and a coup d'etat on university governance. We ask why the mass aggressive opposition to the bill and why the seeming urgency and haste on the part of government to pass it into law. That bill has made its way into parliament under COVID about two times now. Why must it be passed even under COVID? So we are examining the case for and against this controversial university bill 2020. The government has concerns and says the universities have, quote, veered away from their core discipline, unquote, and that annual Auditor General reports reveal, quote, reveal grave improprieties in the utilization of resources, unquote. So this appears to be the chief purpose for the law. The CDD, the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the UTAC are all singing one tune. The government got it so wrong. But how wrong? We find out if these are justifications for what is said to be a coup d'etat to unconstitutionally overthrow independent university governance structures and replace them with direct executive control. Stay right here on Newsfile. We'll be right back to deal with the vex matters. Welcome back. This is News File, it's your most authoritative news analysis platform. I'm your host, Samson Ladi Anyanini. Now, I'll give you a gist of my take, and then you get to read it later. And this morning, I titled my take, MPs, Probe the Judges. In less than 25 months, Parliament has conducted vetting and approved 12, including five women, and a Chief Justice to the Supreme Court of Ghana. Earlier in 2017, and later after the creation of six new regions, it did a similar job approving an historic and bizarre 100 and over a double dozen ministers and their deputies for this small country of ours. Apart from candidates for Attorney General, there are no specific skill set or academic qualifications for the ministerial jobs. One must, however, be an MP or be qualified to be elected an MP. But to be an MP, you must satisfy conditions in Article 94 of the Constitution, including tax compliance and not having been convicted for crimes involving fraud, dishonesty, moral tepitude. That is to say, an act or behavior that gravely violates the sentiments or accepted standard of the community. The central qualification to be a judge, according to the Constitution, is to, quote, 
be a person of high moral character and proving integrity, unquote. A judge swears an oath to keep fidelity to the law and dispense justice to all manner of persons without fear or favor, ill will or affection. The question now is, do our MPs do anything close to assuring us the people they approve, in fact, pass the character and integrity qualification or test? In the recent exercises, it is undoubted that most of the judge candidates have proven track records, while some may be overqualified even. But how many of the MPs demonstrated a search for a vetting to benefit the country? Why must it take only opposition MPs to ask searching questions? And where the approving give citizens a sense of someone who may not be fit for the sacred job of a judge, they still get approved. Younger people follow the vetting and may go away with the thinking our society does not abhor, let alone punish those who do not keep to clear standards and ethics. They may go away getting affirmation that this is not a society of meritocracy. The MPs who sit in those vetting sessions shouting the praises of nominees to do, do so without a sense of embarrassment. And that's a sad reflection of our society. Judges are public office holders, but are hardly in the public eye and are thought not to be subject to the rules of public accountability. I have spoken and written many times in defense of judges and the judiciary, particularly when partisans and wicked, reckless ignoramuses attack them for no reason. But I am not unaware of the problems highlighted by Anas Aramiyao Anas. The judge selection process has improved a bit, but our MPs have an even greater duty to ensure the greater transparency expected in the process for those nominated to serve in the apex courts. One judge's indiscretion can plunge the whole country many years backwards. I share the full take with you right on myjoyonline.com. Thank you very much. So now let's get to meet my guest for this morning. And we have Professor Akusia Aduma Kwampafo. He's Professor of African Studies and Acting Dean of International Programs, University of Ghana, Legon. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Right. Also here in the studio is Professor Kwejua P.J. Etia, Associate Professor of Law, University of Ghana, Legon. Thank you for making time to join us, sir. Thank you for having me. On Zoom, we have Professor George K.T. Odro, former Pro Vice Chancellor and current Dean, School of Educational Development and Outreach, University of Cape Coast. Thank you very much, Prof, for joining us. Great, good to have you. Also, Professor Charles Mafo, UTAC National President. Uh, do we have Professor Mafo on the screen yet? We also have Samuel Sego of the GRASAC. He's a national president. Larry K. Aguado is the editor Colleges of Education Weekly Journal. So it's a packed, thank you very much for joining us. <coughs> it's a packed morning of the people who know and who are affected directly by the new bill, University Bill 2020, that the government is seeking to pass and a lot of questions have been raised about it. 
Among the criticisms that they have raised is that it lacks, it does not appreciate what is known as differentiation, diversification, it impedes that, it's retrogressive. In fact, it sins against the independent governance structures of a university. Also, the autonomy that the university ought to have is going to be lost. A very important thing in the university is academic freedom. They say that will be completely wiped away and reduce the teachers and lecturers in the universities to cowards who cannot do research without prior approval and who cannot speak their mind and to teach the next generation that one ought to be bold to speak their mind about any subject. Among the criticism is that it is unconstitutional and they will refer to various portions of the Constitution to show you why they say so. And that government is suddenly packing the University Council with its people. Overwhelming majority to, as it were, dictate what must happen. There are some who argue he who pays, uh, calls the tune, is it? Okay, so somebody is responsible for them, and that in, uh, in individual or institution must have a say. Must it be a direct executive control or accountability, which must happen as happens everywhere else? So these are the issues that will be canvassing uh, for you on the show this morning. We will also be joined by Samuel Obing, who is Executive Director of Parliamentary Network Africa, to give us a brief as to where the bill is now in Parliament. So everybody, welcome. Thank you. And let's have your views also coming even ahead of time, so we can ask them. And I must announce that before my producers tell me that they have tried all week to have government direct participation, but they have been unresponsive. So we'll proceed <coughs> with or without them. OK. I will first like us to uh, get a, a bit of a view of how you guys are managing in the universities in these covered times. So just, I mean, very briefly, a comment or in uh, a minute or two, tell us about how life is like on the university campus, practically. How is education going on and moving forward? Well, definitely things have changed. Um, when uh, finally, uh, the, initially the university decided that it would close down, um, suspend lectures. But later on, the government came back and said that the university should be closed down. And after that, the students um, stayed for a while to be, uh, make sure that they are not carrying any virus home and so on. After that, they went home. And the new way of doing things is to go online and conduct teaching. And so that is what we have been doing now. Um, in a lot of ways, it's, it's going well, but the students also have some concerns about the online teaching. But we have developed a shuttle, and we have developed most of uh, conducting the lectures and also conducting assessments mm. and, and so on. All yes. right. So that is the new way of doing things on the campuses now. Okay. Do you have ideas as to how long it's going to take to have physical, face-to-face -face interaction with students? Um, we, ca we can't put a date on it. In fact, uh, university management at the University of Ghana is in discussion about this. So you are, you are asking how we are managing. One of the other things, in addition to online teaching, is scores of online meetings. Okay. And so we are always in one meeting or the other trying to address current problems and to foresee problems that may come up. Because we are also looking at universities on the continent who are similar to us and looking at universities globally to you know, have our fingers on the pulse on what's going on. Um, students, are, where I sit in the International Programs Office, 
mostly international students are coming to us with their issues. Mm. Most of them have left, okay. but a number of them, um, a few of them are, are still on campus, and obviously they also have some challenges. And uh, you know, they should, they, we, need, we need students to communicate with us more often um, when they have these challenges. But let me, my concluding comment on how the way forward is that mm. we are constantly constantly in discussion and in meetings okay. to, to see how we can deal yeah. with um, having classes live once again. Right. Um, how badly is the calendar affected, academic calendar affected? Um, for, for now, we cannot say how badly it's affected. Obviously, we have to also be constantly in touch with what the president is saying right. and what the nation is saying. Right. We can only move in step with what the nation says exactly. we must do and what we must, mm. what we must not do. Okay. So we, we take um, guidance yeah. from that. Mm. But we hope, we hope that the, the next academic year can start. In what shape it will start is really what the, um, the question is. Okay. But definitely from where you sit, Professor Odro, you would think that we are going to have to run lectures and assessments, examinations um, virtually for a very long time to come, not so? Surely. Um, if things don't change, then strategically, uh, we, we need to find ways of coping with the uh, new new challenges and those things could could be possible mm. yeah but but effectiveness is it the same doing things virtually and also you know as it were direct interaction with students <clears throat> in a lecture hall well we cannot replace virtual interaction with direct um, contacts you need particularly when we place it in a cultural context as Africans and as Ghanaians, we believe in face to face. Mm. And so um, machines can replace human co contact. So the quality obviously wouldn't be as it should be. But if we find ourselves in a situation where virtual intervention will be the only best thing to do, then we only have to cope with it and find means of enhancing quality. Mm. Yeah. Um, is, is Professor Mafu on the line? Yeah, I'm here. Right. Mm. Professor Mafu, thank you very much for joining mm. us. You, you must be in yeah. Kumasi now, right? Right, right. Great, great. Okay, so um, UTAG, are there any, you know, special brainstorming sessions that you are having as to look at what can be done to give the same quality or even better to students in this time? Yes, Samson, thank you. Um, uh, good morning to your listeners. Uh, yes, uh, we have been brainstorming as to how we could uh, have uh, a better you know, study sessions with our students. And it has not been easy. I mean, you know that over the years, uh, as Dr. Do rightly put it, culturally, we have engaged our students with physical, you know, interaction face to face. And so even where we have used the uh, online system, at some point, we have brought them to school to have that physical interaction with them. And so to go back, uh, go back with uh, online studies with them became uh, problematic. First, in the sense that <laughs> if this is new to us, and in fact, most of our members are not very much into this technological stuff of teaching students online. Mm -hmm. And then also the fact that over the years, universities have not really prioritized online teaching to the extent that we have not invested so much into a, a robust system where if I take a university, for example, 64,000 students could be engaged online. I mean, the system could, I don't think we could contain them. Recently, KNOSP, for example, a lot of, you know, uh, inter uh, uh, interventions have been made with regards to the system. But even that, students also complain. I mean, imagine students that come to campus and on, when they are home, they are far away places where even uh, having internet connectivity is a problem. That's right. So all this has fed into our discussions, and we, we believe that 
if this is going to be, as people call it, new normal, then of course serious interventions should be made. Government should come in, much investment should be made to such an extent that uh, we could do that. And also train us, the lecturers, train us to be used to these things, right? And most of the students also to be helped mm. acquire these gadgets they could be, they could also use to get in touch with us. Right. So something has not been easy at all. Right. Mm. Okay, so the very final question, which is to you and also to uh, the Grassac president, will be, imagine that the president spoke to us tomorrow and he's uh, billed to speak to us uh, sometime in the course of this week, if it's not tomorrow, um, and most definitely will begin a process of easing the restrictions. Um, I doubt that there may be uh, an ease in the restrictions in a manner that opens up, you know, schools for people to return to the classroom. But imagine that happened. Are you ready to get to, back to the classroom, practicing the various, uh, you know, protocols, uh, preventive measures? Yes, I uh, Yes, we need to. I mean. As I always tell uh, people, the world is not waiting for us. Every uh, jurisdiction is trying to take steps towards, you know, getting to the so-called new normal. And so I believe that we have to put things in place. I know if the government mentions it or says that we should go back to classroom, they might have uh, prepared or put in place a lot of protocols as to how we could, you know, go back to school. Uh, so for me, I think when they do that, we will just have to get along with it. And as I've put it, the protocol that will come along with, with it has to be practiced. Hmm. As, at the end of the day, we just have to move on. OK. Uh, Mr. Sego, do you think that this is possible in the immediate time to get back to the classroom? Hello, Samuel. Um. Getting back to the classroom at this moment should be done in a gradualist manner. Hello? Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Getting back to the classroom in this time should be done in a gradualist manner. We believe that we should come back to school in a gradual form. There should be a system where we will allow a certain group of students to come back to school then other batch will come another time. We can't all come to school at the same time. We are talking about of about 3 million Ghanaian students across board going back to school. There will be a lot of movement across the country, mm. and we are going to increase the risk of spread of the virus. So what the student leadership across the country is saying is that government should put steps to ensure that only final years come back to school. And even with that, they should be done in such a way that they will be able to observe critical social distancing protocol. Until then, we should not reopen school. And we are proposing that schools should reopen in August. For the universities, we are already writing examinations. So there is no need to write to open the universities at the moment. Mm. We are doing the online examination, doing um, assignments and all that, and that is fine. But for the BEC and the SSE students, if in any case they have to go to school, then we should be looking at somewhere again, and it shouldn't be immediately the government leaves the ban on the restriction. And that is very important for all of us to ensure safety of every student and the um, teachers in the school. Interesting, interesting views there. Um, so. Now let's get settled to begin to look at the University Bill 2020 and the questions that have come up um, about it. Let's start with the students also who are um, affected by it. The students held a press conference uh, that was is it yesterday or two days ago. Two days uh, ago. Yes, two days ago, and they expressed um, views about the bill. Uh, they don't seem to be entirely against the bill, 
but they want some of the sections amended. Let's uh, listen to uh, Isaac Hyde, the NUCS president on the public university bill. aspects of the bill which needs to be corrected or if possible needs amendments. Then again there has been some calls within the structures where uh, the, the arm of government in terms of government's role or involvement with the operations of the institutions will be a bit problematic looking at the way and manner some appointments will be made. For instance you have the vice chancellor, you have the chancellor and of course the chairman of council all inadvertently being appointed by government. Uh, directly or indirectly, we feel that when you allow some of these things, it subverts uh, independence, it subverts the ability of the institutions to take decisions or initiatives without government interference. And for this matter that we are calling for uh, government to make some amends and also withdraw if same. For instance, there's an aspect where we support government. Quite remember, you know of the uh, Africa Integras uh, case with the University of Ghana. You also know about the University of Ghana medical facility, an instance where there was a tussle between the university and government. Then again, within that same space, you also have in in situations where uh, the state has to use taxpayers' money to go and pay for some of these excesses of the universities. It is for, therefore necessary that to an extent, government must seek to cap. The, the, the level by which investors can be independent. But it also does not mean that it has to be an outright. The former vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, Professor Enes Aite, recently also had a view to express. And for him, the bill is most unnecessary and it will do more harm than good. Listen to him. This bill if indeed it gets passed into the act that uh, governs how our universities are established and run, will be extremely unfortunate. It will destroy everything that universities are meant to represent. Uh, universities are not simply there to train people and give them degrees. The main function uh, for which governments everywhere in the world uh, spend lots and lots of money to put up universities is to generate knowledge so that the knowledge will be used for social and economic development. That's, that's the main reason. And for this, what you want is uh, men and women who are curious. Curious about the things that happen around them curious about what will make development go faster, curious about how people will respond to things, whether treatment or whatever. So as soon as you take away that incentive to be curious, that incentive to search for knowledge, you effectively make the university quite useless. Will the universities be rendered useless indeed? Let's begin by going to Parliament to find out where this bill is now. And joining us on the line is Samuel Bing, who is the Executive Director of the Parliamentary Network Africa, PN Africa. Sami, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me, Samson. Great. So quickly, briefly tell us, where is the University Bill 2020 now in Parliament? Well, um, Samson, so the bill was actually laid in the House on the 11th of March. Um, of course, once it is laid, the Right Honourable Speaker refers it to the appropriate committee. And so he referred it to the Committee on Education. The committee is expected to engage with various stakeholders um, at their level. And, um, make all necessary corrections, amendments, you know, propose amendments and all of that and resubmit to plenary for consideration. At the moment, it is at the level of the committee. 
We have, ra we have heard concerns raised about the bill surfacing in the House a number of times, even during the COVID. What are these concerns really about? And there are those who say, what is the urgency about it that even during COVID, it appears to be tabled in the House? Well, um, as to the urgency of the bill, Samson, um, I think that the executive branch, um, together with the leadership of parliament, the, uh, 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 the, the majority side of parliament will be best to, to, to determine. But it is important to note that um, our, our study has shown that the legislative agenda of government for this particular year um, has a lot of education-related um, legislation you know, draft legislation bills that are ex expected to to get to parliament or that are even already in parliament. So at my last count, I could count as many as nine, nine education-related uh, um, legislation that are expected to be considered by parliament. And this particular bill, you know, um, is, is part of it. Of course, the parliamentary processes allows for some level of urgency and also allows that you know some bills can be taken through processes within a very short period of time. This is not one of the bills that is actually going through the short haul. You know, it is expected to go through the full haul um, and, and and have um, uh, citizens, interest groups, and all of that participation. And, and the education-related you know, bills you are talking about would include uh, the one that brings or bests the Ghana. Uh, tertiary Education Commission, which will replace the uh, accreditation board, among others, right? Yes, yeah, so some say, for example, we have Education Regulatory Bodies Bill, um, we have the Chartered Institute of Marketing Bill, Chartered Institute of Human Resources Bill, the Ghana Book Development Agency Bill, Library Services Bill, Pre Tertiary Education Bill, Ghana National Research Fund Bill, the Ghana Communication Technology University Bill and complementary education agency bill. And it's expected that, of course, um, others would actually be coming in before the House, uh, 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 this particular seven parliament okay. tenure is My not. very final so question to you will be, what are the expectations um, between now and when is this education bill, uh, this uh, university uh, bill likely to be matured or to be passed? Of course, it does appear it will have to go hand in hand with the education regulatory bill. Right, so I'm saying, so we, we are PN Africa Ghana's Parliament and the, and the lawmaking process in Ghana's Parliament and the eight stages, or we break it down into eight stages. So stage one being when the bill gets laid, you know, in parliament, that stage has been crossed. Stage two, the first reading of the bill, which is usually the same day that the bill gets laid, that stage has been crossed. The third stage is when it is referred to parliament, and the committee of parliament has been crossed. Stage four is where committees are sitting on it. So I can say that it's at stage four. After stage four, the committee is expected to have its reports ready, and the committee is expected to present its reports to plenary for what we call the second reading of the bill, where the... Uh, 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 Details of the bill are not discussed, but more of the reasoning behind the bill gets discussed. Then the entire plenary will do consideration, clause by clause consideration of the bill. And of course, the bill will go through the final stage, which will be the third reading, and at that stage gets passed. You see, um, Samson, one of the things that is interesting, and perhaps you, with your experience as a lawyer who, who understands the Constitution better than I do, is that um, Article 106.14, of Ghana's constitution actually stipulates that a bill introduced in parliament by or on behalf of the president uh, shall not be delayed for more than three months in any committee of parliament. Unfortunately, I don't really see that this particular provision in the constitution ever gets complied with. And so it will be difficult to actually say when this bill would actually take its mm. full course. Of yeah. course, our, our experience over the years have shown that for uh, draft legislation that has you know, controversies that has many interest groups and all of that talking about it, it usually takes long. Mm. You know, uh, those ones that usually does not have much interest to go through the stages without do anybody. I get the impression, do I get the impression from you that even though this is on the agenda for this, this session, it could suffer the fate that we have seen uh, with bills like 
the right to information or the affirmative action or the bill about uh, parliamentary uh, disclosure of you know asset declaration and all of those things which appear to take years and then a parliament's life you know is curtailed and another parliament takes over is that your suspicion that because of the interest in this bill it might suffer a similar fate I suspect so, Samson. I suspect so, and it is for two reasons. First of all, the committee that is responsible for this bill, the Committee on Education, has so many, so many referrals that it has to deal with at the moment simultaneously with this particular bill. And usually we know that committees are stretched, especially around this time when COVID, you know, provides for so much uncertainty. uncertainty. And this is the final year of, of the, the life of this current parliament. MPs would actually be going on to the campaign trail. COVID has actually shortened the campaign trail. So that is one of the reasons. Okay. The other bit also is that the seventh parliament is expected to expire, you know, at the, at, after the elections of, of this year. And um, usually when a parliament expires, it expires with the processes that it has actually initiated. And so a new parliament will have to restart the process all over again. Mm. I see. That's interesting. I said my very last, but in 30 seconds, do you really suspect that this will delay as much because of the fact that it gets tabled even within COVID? When Parliament was resuming, was going back to deal with covert specific interventions, it found itself on the bill. We got an explanation that it was a mistake. But there are those who are suspicious that it wasn't a mistake. It, it was intended to be smuggled through the process quickly because we are in COVID. Well, some say if there is one thing that at least I can you know, uh, uh, dove my cap, dove my cap for the Parliament of Ghana on. It is the fact that when it comes to legislation, the legislative function of our of our institution of Parliament, uh, they take it quite seriously. Of course, oversight has its own issues. You know, people have their own concerns about the representational function. But when it comes to legislation, they take it quite seriously. I mean, at the committee level, you can trust that committee members will be very, very scrutinous of mm. this, irrespective of. Uh, the caucus they belong, and right. particularly because the minority caucus has also raised issues, they would not uh, uh, leave it going uh, without much of a fight. And of course, we know the interest groups, the academicians and all, would also not allow this to go. And once media also has to zoom on it, Parliament takes seriously anything that the media has its lenses on. Okay. Thank you very much, Samuel Bing, Executive Director of the Parliamentary Network Africa. Thanks uh, for that uh, explanation and education and particularly uh, getting to know where the bail is and your expectation as to when this might become law at the fourth stage. Now, let me uh, come to my guest in the studio and uh, Professor Kusia Dumakwampafu will start. Um, I have read, I have read, you know, um, analysis, reviews that have been done by various interest groups. I read um, the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. They have done one. I have read one done by UTAC, and thankfully UTAC's president is on the line. I have also read the one by the CDD. And they seem to have all been in the same meeting and, you know, brainstorm on the same ideas because the points of opposition appear to be unanimous. They agree. The bill stifles independence, autonomy. It impedes academic freedom. Um, uh, it is deterrent to innovation. And it will slow decision making. Um, you know, and the usefulness or competitiveness of the university, universities globally. They have a bigger issue with um, the 14-member council. It initially was supposed to be 13, 14-member council, out of which government will appoint as many as nine of them, five by the president and three through the minister. And they think all of this will be a way, sort of a proxy uh, to check and to control what happens, among various other things. What do you say is wrong with this bill? Um, 
Johnson, thank, thank you again. And uh, as we like to say in Ghana, good morning to your cherished listeners. Mm. So, I don't want to deviate from the script. Um, but um, on a, you know, we are here for very serious business. You pointed out that different groups all seem to be in the same meeting. And right. of course, we were not. <laughs> I think it's very interesting that we are all reading the bill in the same way. Um, there are three things that we are saying. The bill, and most importantly, the bill is unconstitutional because the Constitution, um, and I will let uh, Kojo, who's a lawyer, speak mm. more about that, mm. does not give the president the right to make these kinds of appointments at the most uh, senior governance uh, level of the university. And there was a good reason for that, to allow the universities to engage in the kind of business um, that they engage in without being politicized. Okay, that's the first thing we want to say. And I think we will need to go into details with all of this. Of course, we, are the sec we have a lot of time. For this. Mm. The second thing is that the bill is unnecessary. Um, the government has given two reasons, uh, purportedly, why it wants to, uh, why it needs this bill. Um, one being that universities have veered from their core business, which is actually not factual. And we can also go into what is happening with all modern uh, universities of, of, of good repute. And we want we to... We interrogate that question about you veering from your core discipline. Because there are examples around the place. People are asking, why is a, a science we'll, and technology university we will get into all that. of a sudden, you know, have doing so many business courses and law and all of that? We'll, we'll get okay, into that. And right. I think we, we, we also um, owe it to parents and students to, to let them understand how higher education is operating globally today. Right. Uh, and, and let me just slip this in and say that Ghanaian universities, Ghanaian public universities, especially our older universities, have been the envy of many of our colleagues on the continent. Mm. Um, last year I was at a meeting in, in Nairobi and Kenyans were lamenting that with a similar bill, what had, uh, which is now law, their hands are tied in so many ways. And they were like, oh, we really envy you guys in Ghana. Mm. Anyway, so we are saying that the bill seeks to fix something that is not broken. Okay. And indeed, the third thing that we are saying is that the bill will introduce a whole new set of problems that we are currently not uh, grappling with. Mm. And, and Samson, if I may say, I have been teaching at the University of Ghana since 1989. In my time, 30, this is my 31st year, I have worked under seven different vice chancellors, starting with Prof. Akila Pasoya and now Prof. Uh, Ousu. The un I have worked um, on council. I have been appointed to council twice. I worked, um, I, when I joined council, um, Mr. Ishmael Yamsen was the chairman of council. I spent most of my time on council with Mr. Tony Ochin Jesse as chairman of council. And in, as I was leaving, Prof. Dateba was chairman of council. Yeah. This is the highest governing body of the university. And it worked. It worked. How many scandals have people had coming out of the university? If we compare the University of Ghana to other public um, institutions um, in the country, and we can take the other universities as well, how many scandals have we had? Maybe one in five years, another one here. We have weathered many storms very efficiently with our governance structure. The other complaint that the government makes is that about misspending. Yes. We have a governance structure that some of us even find onerous. Committee after committee after committee. The internal auditor will write to you about what we think are minute things that keep us from moving our work forward faster. And the auditor general asks us for our statements of account. So there are already existing pieces of legislation to deal the criminal code is there. The Minister of Finance can demand from the universities explanations. So this is unnecessary. And, and indeed, um, it, I, I cannot speak for all the universities, but I think for most of our 
older public universities. This accusation of uh, financial malfeasance is unfounded. I do not think that the universities are worse than other public institutions. Indeed, I think that our um, reputation for um, accounting, good accounting is much better than many of the public institutions. And the layers of accountability from within all the way to the Auditor General are very, very strict. Mm. Okay. So I'll have uh, Professor Chia t t t talk to us about the questioning of unconstitutionality that she raised and this year comfort zone. So what is unconstitutional about the structure that is being introduced for the appointment uh, of the of the persons that are supposed to get onto the university's governance structure well we think that the bill as it stands offends various portions of the constitution mm. uh, you can talk about at least four provisions the first is the fact that there's reference specifically to academic freedom in the Constitution under Article 21.1b, tied in with uh, that freedom of expression. And so the fact that there's that recognition means that we need to talk about academic freedom itself, and I'll come back to that. The second provision is the fact that coming from the 79th Constitution and repeated in the 1992 Constitution, the President cannot hold the office of chancellorship. And the bill as it stands now gives the, government, the president a backdoor approach to, to perform that very function mm. under Article 68 1B. Then the constitution of council and the chairmanship of council is also provided for in the constitution under Article 1953. And if you look at the bill as it is couched, it rather refers to Article 70 as the basis to constitute council for the investors and vesting that power in the president to do so. However, Article 70 plays a different role. Article 70 is talking about the setting up of a national um, commission on higher education. This commission, in today's terms, is the national uh, um, co commission on uh, tertiary education. And so one cannot replace that uh, uh, institution which already exists or equate it with that of a governing council and use that as a basis for the president to interfere in the constitution and the com composition of the council. Yeah. Now, so if I may go into details of these four elements. The first one, academic yeah. freedom. Yeah. There is, a, a first of all, there, there is some misconception about Before you go to academic freedom, yes. and if you check the, this bill, which you all seem to agree that it, ha it has an extensive, comprehensive definition for academic freedom, except that groups like the CDD say the definition does not mean anything once there is not a proper correlation to allow that freedom to be expressed, uh, as if the bill is giving that freedom with the right and taking it with the left exactly. completely. But before we get to the academic freedom, you refer to Article 68 and then 1953. You say by Article 68, 1 of the Constitution, the president cannot be a chancellor, but he's finding a way to indirectly do that job. And then you say by 1953, the appointment onto the council is not supposed to be done by him. But in this case, he's going to be appointing as many as six of the, uh, six of the members? Eight. Um, Eight. No, six by the president and three by the minister. So the, the, the government will have nine. Right. Take us through these two, 68 and 195, and explain clearly where in the bill the president is seeking to do all, the government is seeking to do what you say is unconstitutional. So as I said, Article 68 1B says that the president cannot be a chancellor of a university. Okay. Now, if you go to the new provision, it is saying that the president 
uh, will, will appoint the chancellor. And the, the, the three persons will be nominated by the council, and then the president will ultimately make the final decision. Yeah. We think that this is a way where the president will end up by proxy be performing that function. So that is where we have the problem with. So but 68.1b yes. of the Constitution of Ghana says, the president shall not, while he continues in office as president, b hold the office of chancellor or head of any university in Ghana. Yes. And you say there's a provision in the bill where he's seeking to do so. Yes. Can in you an show indirect us? manner. Yeah, can you show us that? So, mm -hmm. um, while I try to pull that out, mm -hmm. let me... That's, that's uh, 14, clause 14, uh, uh, 1. Of the of the of the new bill. Clause fourteen one. Fourteen one. Yep. Okay. Mm. Uh -huh. So fourteen one reads Yeah. A public university shall have a chancellor who shall be appointed by the president. So that is where we have the issue with. The chancellor is supposed to play some critical roles in the governance of the university. Mm. He's one of the, he or she is one of the three persons considered as um, uh, principal. principal officers of the university. Uh -huh. And so if you have a situation where the president has the power to appoint the chancellor, then by proxy, the president is performing that role. And I think that is where uh, it offends the against. The constitution says he cannot be a chancellor yes. whilst he's president. In uh, clause 14 of the bill, he is not the one who will be chancellor. No. It is he who will appoint the chancellor. Does the constitution say he cannot do that? The constitution directly that cannot, that does not say by uh, 30, um, 68 one he cannot do that. But if we go to 1953, Five. Five, mm. it is clear okay. that the university council has the power okay. to do that. And, and the University of Ghana has been uh, uh, doing that for some time. And so that is where we, we have an uh, issue with that constitutionally. We should go by 1953. Yes. And if you are going by 1953. We, we should read 1953. Yes. I, yes. I would like us to go to 1953 as well uh, because we need to have everything clearly uh, made out. Uh, at code 1953 uh, says that the power to appoint persons to hold or act in an office in a body of higher education, research, or professional training shall vest in the council or other governing body of that institution or body. Yes. So, and, and Samson, even yes. before that, it mm. says that the president is allowed to appoint officers to public services, except for public universities and other exactly. educational institutions. Yes. Okay. It, is cl it is clear and yeah. unambiguous. Mm. Okay. So clearly on these, you know, issues, this is unconstitutional. Yes. Right. There's another constitutional aspect of it. I want you to address it and then I'll get to um, my other guest on, the, on, the, on Zoom so that we deal with other issues. Then you will come later to deal with the question of academic freedom. You also suggest that the power given by the president in the bill to, as it were, dissolve the university council if there is an emergency is also uh, unlawful. How do you justify that? Well, in the first place, mm. by tradition, this has never been the case. Unless if you go back to the 1960s, when um, uh, during the commerce period, when he had um, a way of even handpicking members to the council. So it gives the president the power to be able to influence the council. Secondly, that provision does not define what is an emergency. Hmm. So it means that in the president's mind, if there is an emergency, that situation can arise. And we have an, an uh, historical antecedent in what happened at the University of uh, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. 2018. 2018, October, October yes. Mm -hmm. When the president 
dissolved the University Governing Council, even dismissed the, the Vice Chancellor, set up an interim council uh, without the normal represent representatives, and then decided to uh, ask this body to run the university. So we think that that is clearly not part of the law and it cannot come into place. Mm. Secondly, but those things you refer to, they obviously were mistakes making, they were admitted somewhat, and then they were sort of reversed, some of those things. There are Santihene, who is a chancellor, subsequently had to assert his authority, and the government seemed to have backed down. Uh, things that ought to have been done through the tertiary, what's that institution again? Um, the QNSC. No, there's the, the tertiary something institution that was supposed to superintend, supposed to do something which it didn't do by way of the appointment and things. The government then later, you know, it, ceded yes. the opportunity to that institution that to institution, do that. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So, so th that is, um, we, are, we are dealing with the bill as it is now. Mm -hmm. And we are saying that that's the fact that it's, it's not defined mm -hmm. what constitutes an emergency is problematic. Mm -hmm. And then, the, and, and then the fact that this council, interim management council, can rule for a stated period, that is also not stated. Okay. So we can't tell how long this can also go on. In connection with that, it is saying that there's a transitional period for the new bill to come into place. And during this transitional period, um, go government will also set up interim management councils to run the universities. Okay. And within that time frame, we don't know the composition of, composition of this council, and it can make laws which would then be operational to run the, way, the, the, uh, to run the universities until they set up a new governing council. Mm. So that, that uh, adds to the problem that we are discussing in this context. Okay. And uh, be, when I get back to you, I'm going to, Professor Drew, when I get back to you on the question of the president's power to collapse the council almost at will because the law says uh, in in the case of emergency and when you read the cdd's review mm -hmm. they say that you don't define the emergency mm -hmm. so it means anything could be an emergency for you you will use to collapse the council and the president also has power um, to fire a member of the council almost at will um, and we will look at that as well but professor Drew, the 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 cliche which is which is true is that he who pays the piper calls the tune these are public universities funded by the state if the executive wants to have a direct control by way of the appointments and the membership of the council and the way the university conducts itself What's wrong with that? Thank you very much, Samson, and uh, good morning to uh, listeners. Samson, universities are the only public funded institutions that invest taxpayers' money in developing critical minds. Critical mind development requires independence. It requires non-interference of processes. And that is the more reason, if you look at the history of university development in, the, in our country, the issue of governance has been tied to academic freedom and autonomy. And indeed, let me tell you that the governance of a university requires that university leadership defends academic freedom, encourage shared governance, promote accountability, ensure meritocracy, and I underline that meritocracy mm. in selection and strive for excellence. Indeed, autonomy and academic freedom of universities are regarded as necessary ingredients for quality delivery of university education. Now, so government funds universities, but government funds universities for a particular purpose. And that purpose is to develop critical thinkers, to develop critical-minded people who will balance 
the interest-oriented decisions that we encounter in our country. Historically, we know, we know that universities had operated under this academic freedom until the 1960s. When the then president, Kwame Nkrumah, wanted to dismiss one lecturer <laughs> for purposes of accusation of having indulged in subversive activities. And the then vice chancellor stood against that and argued strongly that that would be an affront to academic freedom. Thus, Samson led to the then government, CPP government, quickly to initiate means of overhauling the University of Ghana bill <laughs> and abolished Article 15 of the Act, which granted power to the University Council to enact statutes. Enactment of statutes. For the general administration of the intent was installed as the chancellor and so appointed everybody and had the, 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 the power to dismiss anyone at any time. Until 1998, when J.J. Rollins decided not to hold the position of what a chancellor and allow the governing councils to operate in terms of managing the universities, we've had chancellors being um, presidents and they could manipulate the, the universities at any time. And this is why I personally think, and I think I go alongside all those who think that the universities must be allowed to operate as independent institutions that has, can have the freedom to develop the critical thinkers that we need to support our national policy development. The and they must be allowed the autonomy they, they, they require to help them generate knowledge that will not be sectional in orientation, but that will help governments to initiate policies that will serve the interest of government irrespective. To make the university more autonomous and necessary, which is a necessary academic condition, I strongly believe that this bill needs to actually, it shouldn't even be considered at all. There are elements that are good that can be operationalized within the university's own statutes. But as it stands, and I have gone through it, and I have always def defined it as ridiculously complicated in terms of context, contextually unworkable, and operationally suppressive. Why do I say that? If the argument is that the universities are veering from their primary responsibility, Samson, if they are veering from their primary responsibilities, the big question is that, why are they veering from their primary responsibilities? Is it even true? Is it even the case that they are veering from their primary responsibilities? I say no. They are rather adding on to their primary responsibilities. And there are reasons for that. One, demands have increased. And one university cannot be serving the 20 million people that we have in the country. So the need to diverse to meet demand is one. Two, government subvention to universities are greatly dwindling, and yet universities must operate. So there's a need to diverse of, uh, mandate so that you can get something doing. These are contributory factors. Mm. Now, Samson, if you go to the question of universities, complaints, and all those things coming up, my question is, why do we have the regulatory bodies? The university is well structured. The governing councils operate. There are committees that look at all these things. So if for heaven's sake, complaints have gotten to the ministry requiring intervention, why wouldn't the governing councils or the National Council of Tertiary Education be mandated to work on this thing. Does this require harmonization of universities' bills? I think no.
Now, Sam, so let's look at the government nominees. You've already talked about that. Right. Directly, the president appoints five, including the chairman, it's six. Indirectly, the Ghana Education Service appoints one, and then the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission appoints one, making it eight. Eight out of 13, which implies that the government has eight, and out of this, the, the, the bill proposes that seven can form a quorum. So at any point, any seven can, can, can meet and take a decision. And let's not forget that in Ghana, when we talk about government representation, we are not talking about experts. We are talking about political party representation. So in effect, what the bill seeks to promote is to dominate councils with partisan interest, which for me will undermine the basic principles of setting up universities. Okay. All right, Prof, hold on there for me, and let me get to... Uh, Can I just say quickly something yes. about, Charles, the, Charles about the... And Charles Charles Maffo gets ready... The Piper. Yes, Charles Maffo gets ready on the same issue, and I'll read just a, a small portion of what CDD says about that aspect, and then get your view on it, Charles Maffo. So, yes, go ahead. Pick so, up. I think it's important to mm -hmm. underscore the fact that universities are not seeking... Um, to not be financially accountable. We are seeking political independence. I also want to say that to suggest that the universities have had more financial scandals than other public institutions is actually, with all due respect, it's ridiculous. Okay. We can count the number of financial scandals in our universities' histories of 60 and so many years, probably on one or two hands. Take our own ministries, who should then oversee us Year after year, we listen to the Auditor General and we see the financial scandals um, that are there. I think you would, um, our, our systems are very well regulated and as uh, Professor uh, Odro has said, if the, the regulator, the NCTE, sees something going on and doesn't do it, I don't think that adding another piece of legislation um, is going to fix that and I just wanted to put that okay. in quickly. And uh, that's one of the points where uh, in my reading of the various reviews, I seem to find that almost all the groups seem to agree on same issues. Uh, if you read the review by the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences, if you read the CDD as well, they all say, for example, uh, that if you say there are financial improprieties, there is a way to deal with them. There are laws already that exist to deal with them. You don't need to change the university's bail and governance to be able to deal with them. There are acts of fraud, there are acts of crime that must be attended to by the specific laws. Now, Professor um, Charles Marfo, here is what the CDD says about the question of um, he who pays the piper calls a tune. They say that in paragraph one of the memorandum, proponents of the bill appear to suggest that Government invests financially in public universities. Therefore, it must have a say in the management of same. Though there is a justification for this position, government already has a say in the governing structure of universities. Perhaps what government wants is more say. However, it is for good reason that the Constitution of Ghana has provided these arrangements. Similar to the situation where government funds the Electoral Commission, the Judiciary, mm -hmm. the National Commission on Civic Education, the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, the Audit Service of Ghana, but does not dictate how these institutions are run. Universities fall in the same categories. All over the world, governments fund public universities, but they do not dictate how these institutions universities operate. There are many emerging challenges to university education which require a, cons a conscious effort to decentralize, empower, and give more autonomy to universities to ensure that they are able to adapt to the ever-changing environment of learning. In your paper, 25 pages, you pro provide 
alternatives to every so, uh, suggestion in the, in the bill. And yet, you also come to the conclusion that the bill is needless, it ought not, you know, be considered at all. Why so? Professor Charles Marvin. Yeah, why so? Mm -hmm. like, yeah, are you okay? Yes. Yes, good. So uh, I thought uh, you, you wanted me you to follow up a little bit on uh, the question you put to Professor Kroos first before coming to this. And so I was going to say that it is even in the interest of government that investors uh, remain to, to the extent that uh, it is only at that place that uh, what I call wise counseling uh, normally comes from. I mean, you can observe our political uh, generation now where the nation is almost to have right and so as an issue to take position. When it comes to uh, level of uh, conditions, it has always come to blue rightly pointed out. It is that place where, <laughs> should I say, wisdom is made, that where uh, knowledge is produced, right? And people do that with freedom knowing that after they have had, uh, placed their positions, nothing on top of it will happen to them, right? And so we think we need to keep that. I, we, we, we have a, a challenge there with uh, Professor Charles Marfo's line. Uh, but let me um, hear um, briefly from from the Grassack president on this, and then uh, we hope that Prof can correct his uh, his own, and then we can move on. So, uh, Mr. Tego, what do you say about this particular point? The the country when the bill was really put before us, and government position was the fact that the universities are not being accountable in terms of financial propriety and they are bearing off their purpose. The question we asked was that there are quasi public institutions like the Auditor General that audit the financial records of the university. And they have been doing so well in reporting the financial statements of the universities over the years. So why the need for government to now be a participant in how the university spends this money? Does that mean it will subvert the powers of the Auditor General now because you are becoming a participant in how the university runs its administration? And the other issue of the bearing of the question is the NCC, the NAB, that actually approves um, and accredits university's program. So it cannot be that by allowing government to actually um, control how universities are run, um, there will there won't be universities bearing off their uh, purpose. So the position of Grassag is that um, this bill is really needless. That's the first thing. And um, it solves only a problem that exists in someone's imagination. That is really what we are saying. Whose interest is government seeking to protect with this bill? Is it the interest of the state, the electorate, the administrators, or the government itself? What we see here, really, as student leaders, is that government is trying to protect itself by introducing the bill that gives it unimpeded control over the university. And we are worried about that because in the case of I'm a student from KNWC, so I'll use KNWC as an example. On the 22nd of issue, the remote cause of this um, fracas on campus was that the halls of residence were converted from a mill hall to make sure and students were unhappy and all that. We had the Minister of Education then, I mean, Mr. the Minister, actually um, siding with government, uh, with the, with the uh, institution, that it was a good idea. Now, when the issue happened, the, the, the government decided to excuse itself and say it's the university council's fault, so they were dissolving the university council. Now, our problem is that in the future, where now government and the university are together, 
on a matter of this sort. The students will be the ones to be affected because we don't have anyone to um, run to. When it happened on the 22nd of October, students now had the feeling that, okay, we can run to government because even though it is the minister who somehow um, accepted the proposal from council, we still thought that the president could have um, a supervisory rule over the activity of the university and the decision of council. And indeed, when we went, government decided to dissolve the council, which we then felt that the student felt it was needless. So we decided that we will side with Professor Reed and so then. Now, with this new bill, what we are seeing is that government will not only be a supervisor in the activities of the university, government will now be an active decision maker. So in case of any factors or issue that affects students, we will not have anyone to run to, and it will create more problems for the university. So our concern really is that this bill threatens the stability of our university. It threatens the stability of our university because we think Section 5 um, is problematic. And the fact that the government, the president, can dissolve the council at any time in, in terms of emergency creates a problem. This provision in the bill that the president may dissolve and reconsider the council in the case of emergency and appoint an interim council to operate for the fated period cannot be accepted really in this bill. What, why are we saying this? What kind of emergency are we talking about here? What kind of emergency? Is it when there is a disturbance in the hall or when there is a faculty demonstration? What kind of emergency are we talking about? Or, or, and the bill or when, when some of the reviewers have asked a question, or when by something government is trying to do, students are not happy about it, and then, as it were, they start their demonstrations, that will be an emergency, and the government will, as it were, collapse, and, and, collapse the university council when it is not their fault. And, and exactly the point I'm coming to. Ordinarily, these emergencies may be a decision by government, a decision by a hall of residence, or a decision by even a faculty. It may not really be a decision by council. And the fact that there is a disturbance on campus does not call for the dissolution of the university council. Okay. You uh, understand? Yeah. And what is even worrying that the bill says the council should be dissolved. And please, what? A council when not even investigated to ascertain the causes of those emergencies. Okay. Why not even suspend the council for let's say a month or two? Mm. Appoint an interim council to investigate the causes of those um, disturbances and understand whether the council is really as fault or they will be generated. Why would you even dissolve it in a certain place? So it tells us that government is only interested in having control okay. over the university. All right. And our worry is that mm. it's possible that this government has good intentions. They want to ensure accountability. But there may be future governments that may not really be charitable with the universities. And any lecturer or vice chancellor who rises in terms of um, speaking their independent mind against government policy may really face the act of government. Interesting. Interesting that somewhat you have trust in the one introducing the policy, but you have a fear that someone might misuse it in future. But um, I, I need to take a break. I need to take a break. I need to take a break. But before I do that, Larry K. Agbador, the editor, Colleges of Education Weekly Journal, uh, will give us, uh, you know, a brief um, of his views, particularly on the questioning that when we come back, we shall pay a lot of attention to. The questionings of the universities veering from their core principle and then academic freedom. Where do you stand on this charge, which is one of the major reasons for the introduction of the new bill, that the universities have veered away from their core disciplines?
Okay, he's talking, but we can't hear him. I suppose his mic is uh, muted. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah good. It's okay now. good. I can hear you now. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay, so as I was saying earlier, good morning and good morning to my colleagues, senior panel members. It's a privilege to be on the same platform for, with them. Uh, kindly permit me to share my views on a question you asked at the beginning about how the online learning is ongoing. Because with the colleges of education, there's something very key that we need to draw attention to over there. You know, colleges of education train teachers. It's a pre-service teacher training institution. And in this era that this COVID has made everything look the way it is, Personally, I'm not okay with this online learning for trainee teachers. These are people we are training to go out there and also teach the younger ones. You are teaching them methods of teaching. And I don't know how that is going to be possible through the online system. So in the first place, I would like government to take a very uh, good look at this. Other institutions can roll out the online learning, but for colleges of education, I think we should take a critical look at that. Mm. Now, coming to the university bill, uh, it will interest us to know that colleges of education, we have about 46 colleges of education across the country. And it will interest us to know that the entire bill, the entire bill does not even cover colleges of education proper. The only part of the bill that I would say covers uh, colleges of education is when you go to section three, section three clause three, where it speaks about the minister of education, where it speaks about the minister of education in consultation with the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission and other relevant institutions, and in accordance with the act, declare any college or public tertiary institution as a constituent college of a public university. Where a college or a public tertiary institution is established or declared as a constituent college of a public university under subsection 3, the governing council of that college or public tertiary institution shall be responsible for the constituent college of that public university. Now, when we look at this section of the bill, you realize that as we speak now, colleges of education, uh, an act that was passed in 2012, were upgraded into tertiary institutions. Aside that, these same colleges are currently under five public universities University of Ghana Legon, University of Cape Coast, Winneba, KNUST, and UDS. So we have these 46 colleges of education across the country that have been shared among these five public universities. And these public universities are mentoring them. In the next two, three years, this mentoring session will be over. Now, after the two, three years, the colleges will not be on their own to choose which institution they would like to go under. And in preparing a bill like this, which is very, very important in determining the progress of education in Ghana, it is just fair enough that we make room for colleges of education. I'm not speaking for the various uh, groups or unions that we find in the colleges of education. But per my interactions with the leadership of the various groups that we have in the colleges of education, I got shocked that they have not even been uh, consulted on this bill, be it uh, CTAC, CENSAC, uh, the junior union, which is TAC, or even uh, Prinkoff. They didn't make this formal to me, but per my personal interactions with them, I realized that most of them have not, even if not most, all of them have not even been consulted in drafting this bill. Mm. Per my checks at Parliament, I realized that there's likely to be a stakeholder consultation next week, after which there will be a second consideration uh, of the bill. And 
these are people that at least, if not for nothing, needs to also make an input into this door. When are they going to be consulted? Will the bill be passed before we come back that we take their inputs? Okay, those are very interesting <laughs> questions there. Uh, and on that, that okay, on that note, we take a quick break, and when we return, like I told you, we will, we will interrogate the question that one of the main reasons the bill is being introduced is that the universities have, quote, veered away from their core discipline. How true is that? Don't you see signs of that? But is this the solution? And then academic freedom, very important central part of any university's growth. Is it true that it will be completely taken away if this bill passes? We'll be right back. You're welcome back. This is Newsfile, it's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on Newsfile, we put Ghana first. So, as uh, we, let's now deal with the question, and I'm not forgetting that you deal with the question of academic freedom, and we will deal with it exhaustively. But let's begin to interrogate the question of veering away from your core discipline. And I asked myself, if I looked at, say, UPSA, I had an idea what UPSA appears to have been set up to do. But as we speak, it does appear to me that they are doing things that don't seem to be what they were originally set up to do. If I look at the university, uh, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, by the time I l was done with my first degree, 2002, 2003 academic year at the University of Ghana, I needed to do law. When I went to Legon, the year we went, they stopped the law until you have done your degree. So I was in Kumasi. Now, if the KNUST had not set up a law faculty, what it meant was that I would have had to come all the way to Accra to get a law degree in 2005. So whilst they may appear to have veered from what they were set up to do, um, some of us may not blame them. But that's the fact. The universities are veering away. KNSC, they're doing business, a lot of business courses now, doing law, all sorts of things. But we know that that was supposed to be a science and technology, hands on. The technical universities, there is one gentleman who has also submitted a memorandum to parliament, uh, Albert Kwashiga. And his mem in his memo, he makes the argument that the traditional universities have actually not veered away from their core mandate. It is rather the technical universities that appear to have veered away. And there is evidence to show, even if you check from the National Accreditation Board's own report of 2015, 2016, thereabout. So it's a fact. Many of the universities are veering away from their core uh, values or core uh, disciplines, except if this is the solution, we don't know. Uh, Samson, if I can say five things, but before that, let me just remind all of us that it is the taxpayer who is uh, funding uh, higher education. Right. And so we should be accountable to the taxpayer, not to any particular government that happens to be in power. And I need to remi remind us that okay. when we say governments are funding, governments are run by particular political parties. Okay. But it's the taxpayer um, that is funding. And, right. and also to say, that over the years, the, the funding from central government for higher education has dwindled consistently, and that most of our, or a lot of our funding to run, government pays salaries, but most of the money we have to run our research and training comes from internally generated funds. People like us sitting here, when we close, we go and sit at home for hours, when others are sleeping, writing research proposals, revising them, submitting them, it is denied you, you try again, it is denied you, you try again, you send it somewhere else, hours and hours, so you can get money to do the research you need to do. 
to get scholarships for your PhD students to join you in the research. So I, I, I need to put that on the table. All right. But there are five things I would like mm. to say about um, veering from our mandate. The first is that I don't believe this, that the evidence has been provided for this. Um, if we have veered from our mandate, let us know. Where have we veered from our mandate? I don't believe that um, this is factual. Public universities have different histories. And over the course of time, we look at what is evolving around us. So my first point is I don't think that this is um, factual. University Second, of Ghana. Please, let me, let me outline them and then okay. we'll come to them. Secondly, any time new programs have been established, it has gone by law. We have not just got up one fine morning and said, oh, let's look at peace and security. It has been backed by law. Our statutes have established these programs. And for example, the University of Ghana, the 2010 statutes went to parliament. Parliament approved it. What are we saying about our parliamentarians? The third point is that all over the world, universities evolve to meet the ecosystem that we are living in. It may interest uh, listeners to know that MIT, which is a technical university, high up there in the US, they do Asian studies, they do gender studies, they do theater arts, they do African studies. Is it part of their mandate? They have realized that these are courses that they need in the contemporary world. In addition to that, we want our students to be rounded. Should you learn only maths, you must have some understanding of the social world. Mm. You must appreciate philosophy. I remember when Mr. Otinjesi was chairman of council, he said that his study of philosophy had helped him in law and had helped him in business. We need rounded human beings who can think critically. And um, the last point that I would like to make that is that even if it were true that we have veered from our mandate, what is the NCTE doing? Was it just sitting down sleeping, watching us veer from our mandate? Do we need a new law to keep us uh, on our track? So those are the, the, the five um, you know, most so, imp so you important you, you almost have answered the question I was about to ask. You preempted it. And the question was that, as I know, even without reading, it will be that University of Ghana, for example, was set up and to do mainly in the humanities. But University of Ghana now has a big business enclave, so to speak, a business school. Um, of course, the University of Ghana Medical School has existed for a long time. But people can see and say, this is not the core thing you were set up to do. There's a bit of maybe too much focus on the business angle, business school aspect of what you have to do. But who determines how much is too much? If we create graduates in business studies, what proportion of our students? Has there been any national analysis to say we need only two business graduates a year and that they best come from this or that university? I think that we must do things objectively and scientifically just to you know, make a sweeping statement that we have veered. And, and in any case, uh, as I said, mandates evolve. Mm -hmm. You look at the ecosystem you are living in. You don't say that if in 1957 or 1958 we needed these um, disciplines, that today we're not looking at them. Peace and security has evolved as a very important area of study. Mm. Should we sit back and allow other universities around the world to pursue it, but we do not? Look at Noguchi, the Center for Medical Research. If not for Noguchi and other such centers, today in this COVID era, we would be hanging. Mm. And Noguchi has gone out looking for funds these, most of these funds have come from their own hard work and innovation, searching for external resources. And here we are all enjoying the benefits um, of that research. Have we veered from our mandate? Should we have just been training doctors and left out the, the research institutions? Um, I, think, I, I think we should be a, a little bit more critical mm. when we are making such um, okay. you know, comments. And let me bring in Professor Mafu uh, here. And uh, Professor Charles Mafu, what do you say about this, particularly relating to the KNUST? And you have heard me, you know, <laughs> uh, state what I think may have been the case for KNUST already. 
Right. Well, obviously, I mean, as uh, Prof. Uh, rightly pointed out, who decides who has I mean, veered off his, uh, his or her mandate? The fact of the matter also is that, I mean, we are in a contemporary world where things keep changing. And so when things around us keep changing, you don't expect us to say where we are. We don't expect Again, you to be, to be jack, jacks of all trades and master of none. That, that, well, that is true, but who is being the jack of all trade? I mean, as uh, it was rightly pointed out, there are bodies that will put us in check if we are veering off in any way. But as Prof rightly pointed out, there is no evidence to suggest that. In fact, NCTE norms suggest that if you are supposedly a, a science and technology a university, there is a proportion that you could do other areas uh, of acad academia. But I must also point out, point out that, Sam, uh, it is true that numbers are getting, uh, the country keeps getting bigger with a number of students uh, looking forward to getting to universities, right? Place must be made av available for them. And that is why I like the point Prof. Adbaku made that uh, uh, it is a the people, the taxpayer, that funds the university and their needs will have to be taken care of. I must also say that it is true and it is clear that courses that has to do with science and technology are very, should I say, expensive to create. But when it comes to the social sciences, normally you don't need much to, 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 to have the courses, you know, uh, started. And so this also coupled with the fact that Subventions from government has over the years been reduced to the extent that the university will have to rely on a foof, or I mean, that is internet generated funds and fees and staff we take from students. It is obvious then that we will have to take in students and what are the courses that are students, students are aspiring for? It is the courses in, as you rightly put it, a law, business, should I call it the contemporary, you know new courses and so if that is what would take an university to fund itself appropriately considering the fact that governments over the past few years have not been able to well equip the universities and we come to the universities right now most of the infrastructure development that are going on are being done through igfs how could we have done that if we had not been adventurous enough to introduce these new courses these days, Sam, you can also think about accommodation. We keep on uh, expanding normally without putting much into accommodation. And so if somebody will go to, say, Lagos, where the law is done uh, traditionally, and he will go and face up academic uh, accommodation problems, but in Kumasi or Ashanti region, where the, the person lives, he could comf comfortably stay at home and still get the opportunity to pursue the same law at KN West. Why should a nation, in the name of a so-called mandate, refuse such a student the opportunity to study law? So I believe that it comes with a change of times. Times have changed, and so the universities, as autonomous as they are, should be allowed to look into, you know, should I say, the, the, the crystal, and then do what it is supposed to do in order to be able to run very well. Prof. So this yeah. so-called mandate thing, uh, something that's not, that does not sit well with, with, with us. Right. Pro Pro Professor Drew, what do you say about this? Is it not really the case that, for example, the okay. University of Education Winneba was set up for a particular purpose and there is need for regulation legally to keep it to that mandate of training the trainers. If KNUST, Osajifu, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah's dream and the nation's uh, dream at the time was to give us the engineers and to produce the, the scientists, the doctors, the physicians, it should, there should be law that keeps them right there rather than diversifying in the manner that they have done? Uh, but before I, 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 I go on, let me ask, 
There's a law that grants mandates to the University of Ghana. The law that grants mandates to the University of Cape Town. The existing law that grants mandates to Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. Has that act in any way changed? The mandate has been prescribed by these, each of these acts, and it has not changed. So what difference would it make if these acts are harmonized and presented as a harmonized bill? What would it change? Are we saying that by harmonizing the act, commitment to the mandates and suppression of fearing will cease? Are we saying that harmonization of the act will prevent University of Cape Coast, for instance, from running a medical program? Are we saying that it will prevent University of Ghana from running education programs? So we see something. I think that the government is only using this to cover up the real intent of the bill. And with your permission, I think let me just link it up. If we go to Article 45, permit me to read, Article 47, it reads, the minister may give directives on matters of policy through the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission to a public university. And the public university shall comply. <laughs> Samson, this is the key motivation of the bill. The issue of hearing and all those things, they are just, a clone, they are just using it to clone the real intent. And this is where I think stakeholders' concern has come up. Because if you kill university autonomy, if you kill academic freedom in universities, you destroy quality policy making in the, in the nation. Let me give you three instances where I think that this bill, if it goes through, the university will suffer. In 2010, I was the chairman of council of Takrade Polytechnic, now Takrade Technical University. A deputy minister calls me as chairman and directs that I should ask the then uh, rector to proceed on leave. I ask why, because the act and the statutes clearly indicate that the chairman is a chairman of council, and the council is the highest decision-making body. And so I drew his attention to this. Eventually, I was nearly removed back for the authorities then going strictly by the provisions of the act. And so that decision couldn't go through. Hmm. In 2011, another deputy minister of education, by radio announcement, decided that a program that had been approved by the academic board of the University of Cape Coast, granted accreditation by the National Accreditation Board, by radio announcement, that deputy minister ordered that that program should be removed from University of Cape Coast, specifically from the Institute for Educational Planning and Administration to GIMPA, hmm. by radio announcement. There too, we had to make reference to the act provisions. And because of that, that couldn't be implemented. Currently, there was someone, you, the Institute of Economic Planning and Administration has been upgraded to a category two status by UNESCO. And there's someone who has been actively involved in this. That person was to be granted a position at that place. The vice chancellor couldn't in effect that because the Minister of Education is alleged to have made a pronouncement against the appointment of that particular person. So you see, if this bill goes through, and Article 47 as it is goes through, we stand to experience a situation where in future, 
Even the appointment of a laborer in the university has to be determined by the Minister of Education. And this is why, for me, I think that this bill is a non starter. Mm. The existing provisions we have in our Act provide for accountability and all those things that the proposed bill harmonized the ones to do. And so okay. that is strengthen the act, the operationalization of the existing act, All right. and then encourage mm. governing councils to ensure that operational challenges within each university are corrected. All right. Government uh, mm. must intervene, mm. but government must not interfere. All right. This Thank bill seeks to make government interfere in university governance. And All right. it must not be allowed. Uh, thank you. Thank now, you, now let's let's hear uh, briefly from the Grasak president uh, on the question of veering away from the core mandate, but also very importantly, the section 47 that Professor Drew has just mentioned, which he says is the real intention of government and not about veering away from the uh, mandate. The the memorandum or the review done by UTAG says that, unfortunately, the bill does not provide any avenues to the public university if, in its opinion, a particular policy directive is inimical to the mission and vision of the public university. In other words, if the implementing body, i.e. the public university, is not in consonance with any policy directive from government, it becomes redundant and difficult to implement. The provision also offends institutional autonomy, thus we call for it to be expunged. Is it your view, uh, Samuel, that this is the real intent to have the minister, as it were, direct how yeah. the, the universities should work? Yeah. So, I mean, in the instance of the hearing of, of the investment money, the question we are asking ourselves something is that we should just imagine a situation where only the University of Ghana runs a law faculty. Or imagine a situation when only Cambridge is running medical school or engineering program. How many professionals of that sort can you produce at the nation? Look at the situation that even we have um, four universities running medical program in addition to the Ghana Academy of Arts and Science. And we still lack medical doctors in our district. So if we say university should go by their core mandate, you are into business, run business program, you are into science, right? Run science program. How many doctors can we be produced? How many engineers can the nation produce? How many lawyers can the nation produce? So the argument of hearing of I think is a non starter at all. And as I said earlier, NCP is a supervisory body of the tertiary institution. And they approve the program of the university. And it is a state agency. Right. NAB actually accredits every program. In fact, before your program is accredited, you have to go through a series of approvals mm. back and forth with NAB before your programs are approved. And NAB is a quasi state institution. So it cannot be that government does not have control over the program the units are running. Government really has a say in the program they make it around. That is why we also believe that the argument that has been um, expanded so far that the government just wants to control the investment and using these two excuses as reason should not really be tenable and we should not accept. Okay. Can you imagine something that the membership of the university council even has been reduced to the way that it affects the representation on the university council. Either to Grassard had membership on the university council. The Grassard and the SRC presidents were on the university council. And with these two students, um, representatives on the council, we were able to represent students in such a way that 
the students' interests were always on the table at the university council, both at the undergraduate level and the postgraduate level. Now, with this bill that is being introduced, government has removed the rep from the postgraduate association. In such a manner that only the undergraduates will have this on the council. It is just a way to put it its way through in terms of policy and directives to the university. And if we do not accept that, this should be the way forward. So I think generally the argument is politic from every person mm. that this bill only seeks to give government control. And this control is only given that they can do anything without a um, program from the council or the community management. Mm. And what government is doing now, I believe, is that they want to give the active participants in the day to day running of the university. They want to be active participants in the day to day running of the university. And invariably, the university becomes like a secondary school. So, in, um, I think, 2019, the headmaster for IP Memorial Secondary School was dismissed because of um, what they call the sabotage of um, a, pol a policy by government. It can happen that a vice chancellor, because the office has given a directive, and the vice chancellor is saying that this directive is related to the interest of this university, that vice chancellor will also be dismissed as well by the um, council or by the minister. Because the law says we shall comply. So if you don't comply, then you actually face the fact. But we can't run our investment in this manner with fear and with authoritative control. We cannot run our investment in this manner. That is why we are also against the bill in totality. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, I have uh, now been joined by uh, um, Vincent, Vincent Eko Asafwa, who is Director of Communications of the Ministry of Education. Vincent, thank you very much for joining us. Samson, good morning. Great. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'll come to you uh, shortly, but before I do that, let me come to uh, Professor Tia on the question raised about Clause 47 of the, of the bill, which says the Minister of Education shall give directions as to policy and the university shall comply mandatory shall comply um, apart from that problem uh, there are also problems that some of the reviews have raised including the issue of research having to be subject to the prior approval of the ghana uh, tertiary Education Commission, which is also to be set up. Um, again, admission to the universities will become completely not under your control as a university. You don't determine who comes in the university. Um, how are these unlawful and why should they be opposed? Because if it is harmonized, anybody puts in the application just like you go to uh, SHS. There's a computerized system that determines where you go. You just get up and go. The universities don't have to determine that we are the ones who will approve that you come to us or you don't come to us. And beyond that, the question of the direction. Why is the suspicion that a minister will be giving a direction that is not in the interest of the advancement of the university? Why that suspicion? We have a number of structures in place, and these structures are supposed to regulate the function of the university. Key among them, at the senior most level, is the university council. The university council has powers clearly defined for them in the law, both in the act and in the statutes. So why should a minister be giving out directives and then it, we, the university will have to comply? So clearly, it's a case where it, it, it veers into undemocratic territories where the government will be able to influence what happens at the university. But already you say the government will have uh, uh, nine appointees over more than majority and they can actually, they are more than the quorum that is needed at the council. So what this, this clause is doing, they can equally do at council. So what's the point? 
Yes, this one is even um, more dangerous because it's as if when the directive comes today, then it's being implemented. It says you shall comply. Yes, with the council, the, at least there'll be some procedural issues to go through. Yes, so it is adding to the difficulty that will be placed in the way of the university to be able to function normally. And, and then um, it talks about external control. Mm -hmm. That external control is also being beefed up. And so it makes it more difficult. So that's my question function. then. Yeah. Uh, what's the suspicion and fear? Apart from the excesses that uh, Professor Drew refers to, where some minister picks a phone and tries to, you know, <laughs> uh, call the shots and they resisted such stuff. Why should you have fear that a minister who is responsible for education will not be thinking good about the advancement of the university? So if they give a directive, you should not be uh, compelled to go by it. Something we, we've made a point that people, ministers, and other appointees of government may not necessarily be people who have the competence and, and all the expertise. And they are beholden to government. They, they are beholden to government. So for that matter, they are not able to make independent mandate decisions that is in connection with the ensuring that the investors' um, statutes and objectives are met. Mm. And so in the end of the day, it's to serve the interests of the government, and certainly uh, there will be a problem there. Mm. Yes. The, 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 the bit of an aspect about this is that you seem to be also concerned that through the tertiary education regulatory um, bill 2019, if that is also passed, then the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission will be performing a function in the fashion of a regulator rather than a liaison of sorts between the universities and the ministry and government. Um, you think that this is a further layer of control through the minister. This group would take the job of the National Accreditation Board. Is the National Accreditation Board presently something you don't like because you are happy about the fact that it approves your programs? We don't have problems with the National Accreditation Board. Every um, program that comes into place or any institution that wants to be established as a tertiary institution needs to have some re regulation and mechanism in place to ensure that mm. it really performs according to the dictates of the law. So we don't have any problem with that. Mm. But to have a situation where this institution that we are talking about, when it comes into place, it is going to become more beholden to the government. The structure that are being put in there is to limit even the 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 uh, the current position of the law or of the National Commission of Higher Education, which is like a buffer between the uh, university and the government, is going to be broken. And so the government will be able to use the new institution it's going to set up to be able to interfere in the running of the university. So it, it seems to be um, some kind of structure in place, every stage of it the government is trying to introduce controls into the university. Mm -hmm. So if you put everything together, cumulatively, it really breaks down the institutional autonomy of the university. It affects the ability of the academics. It also affects, affects the ability of the students. In, in other words, the entire academic community to be able to function, creating that atmosphere that is needed for research to be undertaken, for knowledge to be produced, and for dissemination of the knowledge, which is for the well-being of the society. So, think. Professor Admakampo, for you, Elia spoke about research, which is something you do and how you need to do to even assist your students to be able to get the needed upgrades and then you can grow, you know, the next generation of uh, lecture, lecturers and teachers. The Ghana Academy of Sciences um, Arts and Sciences Review made one point that it is extremely disturbing to the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences that researchers can proceed with research project agreements only with the approval of the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission. How bad is this? Uh, something, it is terrible. Mm. Let, let me just say that when we talk about academic freedom, mm. we are not saying that we want to get up and just do anything. We are talking about the freedom to think and do research on important issues. 
Um, there has been a recent example in Cameroon where a lecturer was dismissed because he inserted an exam question that sought to look at some of the teacher upheavals in Cameroon. As we know, there have been serious issues between the so-called francophone and anglophone um, areas of the country. Yeah. A lecturer decides to ask a question in a political science um, exam so that students can think about these issues. And he is dismissed for this. The francophone countries have the kind of system that this bill seems to be directing us to. Mm. And it means that the freedom to decide what you put on your syllabus, which course you will teach, which program will be established, which exams you will set, which research you will do, who you engage research with, are all in the hands of the Minister of Education. Because the clause says, and I read, the minister may give directives on matters of policy through the Ghana Tertiary Education Commission. And this is on establishment of un academic units, financial matters, research and other collaborations. So the uh, so-called uh, Tertiary Education Commission is working for the minister. He is working through them, or she is working through them. So take, uh, for example, currently, I have a research agreement with a colleague at the University of Birmingham, funded by the British Academy. Imagine that we want to examine corruption at the Ministry of Education. Do you think we will get the support to get, to get those research monies? The Minister of Education at that point in time will say, this is not uh, research worth doing, or they will just delay us if they are so minded to do. But let there, us there, also there's, add there's minister, that view. There's, there was a minister who superintended investigations of an agency of his government, JIDA, mm -hmm. to find out the rot in the system. So it's possible that the Minister of, the minister of Education will actually be happy to know oh, the rot in the system. We should not make laws for individual human beings. I think that in this country, we are complaining about our constitution that it was made to satisfy somebody. Let us not make laws thinking that there's a good or a bad person in office. Governments come, governments go. We have layers of gov governance to check individual flaws. Mm. Me, I think I'm not a bad person, but I'm human. There may be A or B that I like and I don't like. If I have unfettered powers, surely I will be tempted to squeeze the one that I do not like. Power and corrupts, to, absolutely. Power, power corrupts, corrupts, absolutely. Absolutely. We are human. We should not set laws that allow human beings and governments to do what they want to do, and not without, with education. Education is the pinnacle of how we get our societies to, to develop. That's where the thinking goes on. That's where the research and development happens. If this bill passes, we are going to, in our tradition, we have for eight years of one government. It will be eight years on campus where the political uh, climate is one, is the NDC, the next time is the NPP. So me, if I'm a supporter of this or the other party, or am I even perceived to be one, mm. during the eight years or four years that the other party, or that pa you know, the other party is in government, I will keep quiet. Mm. I will not do my research that may be perceived to be uh, problematic. Okay. I will not do the social policy work that uh, academics do for free. Also go to the question of academic freedom, which we will deal with. And I uh, should, Samson, yeah. mm. I have heard mm. informally from one or two of our international partners, I mentioned that I'm acting dean of international programs, okay. that if this law goes into force, they will uh, discontinue their programs with us. Oh. Because, yeah, because they cannot trust that there will be a bad government who will say, there's a, um, a crisis, there's an emergency, let's close the university down. And then, for how long? Mm. In 83, 84, the universities were closed down for the longest period we can imagine. Okay. So that interference is a possibility. Mm. And donors and partners do not want to take a risk. They, they, if they don't work with Ghanaians, they will work with South Africans or Nigerians or whoever. So if there is a potential or a perceived threat to that freedom to do the research, they will just withdraw. Okay. Now let me get to a call, Vincent, uh, Vincent Ekoa uh, of the Ministry. 
uh, to share, to seek to justify some of the points here. I've been playing the devil's advocate, but I'll admit that it's been difficult playing it at certain points uh, because very clearly some of the provisions and what we seek to do appear uh, to be unconscionable, uh, to be very char charitable. Um, one of my viewers, there's a couple of them who have sent a number of messages. One, um, Kwame Sapongesiedu says that uh, one thing I enjoyed in my graduate school days was my ability to walk into lectures and seminars in the humanities to enjoy these fields of study. In particular, I enjoyed the literacy, economics, and social anthropology lectures. This university was set up in 1901 as a polytechnic with a core mandate to train scientists and blue-collar engineers. You talking about KMSC? Okay. Today, these three sidebars that took me away from the streets of biomedical research are the underpinnings of most advocacy I engage in. Has this university drifted from its core mandate by venturing into arts? That's a question Kwame is asking. Uh, another question or view sh uh, shared by Kweku Entribue Siakon is, the universities may have veered from original programs or disciplines, but they still provide higher education and he highlights higher education. What's wrong with that? The world is changing and universities must adapt rather than stick to specific subjects. He says that does the university cease to exist or function when there is an emergency? This is a spurious excuse for government intervention in universities. And that brings me to the question for you, Vincent. Of the two-pronged reasons, main reasons for the bill, universities veering away from their core disciplines and revelations in the Auditor General's report of improprieties in the utilization of resources. What is this harmonization you are seeking going to do to solve the problems you have uh, you have outlined in the memorandum well samson let me say a very good morning to your cherished um, viewers and listeners um let me first of all indicate that this is not the first time ghana as a nation is experiencing reforms in the education sector um one that can be readily available and can come to mind is the 1987 educational reforms, the tertiary education system, where um, there was a revelation that 0.7% of the relevant age group was represented at um, the various universities in Ghana here, the relevant age group cash point. And if you could just oppose that with um, the other countries, the global nations that we have, um, you could realize that some nations were even having up to 50 um, percent. Um, again, we also have the 2004 um, educational reforms, um, which um, had the specific uh, mandate that is by the committee to um, ensure that we upgrade institutions such as the NAFTI, upgrade GIG, the Regional Maritime Academy, and what have you. And so, somewhere around 2018, as part of the usual reforms that the Ministry of Education um, had to um, go into. The Minister of Education, that is Dr. Matthew Poku Pempe, sanctioned a committee um, that was chaired by um, CN Tegu. And if, if you check the terms of reference of um, the Professor CN Tegu committee, um, the pivot for um, its terms of references was to ensure that they produce um, a reference document containing essential government policies and institutional best practices that would position tertiary education institutions to optimally execute their national institutional mandate. And so clearly, 
we we had seen that if you had to bring about a, uh, a reference document that every university in this country would resort to in, in terms of governance and administration in terms of access in terms of um, quality assurance um, in terms of um, administration what have you clearly we decided that it would be proper to bring about some standardization as far as the management of our universities are concerned now if a university for example university of ghana um, so decides that as part of this management mandate, they can go into a loan or they can secure a loan for the University of Ghana without recourse to the government. Is not the problem has not been that government or Ministry of Education should be interested in what the loan is being used for. But in, in instances whereby there is a default or there is a problem by the University of Ghana, that the University of Ghana will now rush to the Ministry of Education or government that government should come to their aid. Then, I believe it suggests that the Ministry of Education or the government should always have the role to play in the administration or if you like the governance of the various universities because if you are making decisions as to how resources are being used in the various universities without recourse to the government, but when there's a problem, do you resource to government? Then, um, these were part of the rationale, if you like the reasons, how or why um, government had to have a role to play. Now, if, if you check the current tertiary education policy that gave birth to the public um, university it's bill, a lie. clearly the tertiary education policy um, sought to ensure that as part of the management of, of the various universities, um, we will have to ensure what we call external representation and internal representation, or if you like, the oversight responsibility that government needs to play through the Ministry of Education, we need to play it adequately. Now, the internal regulation or the internal administration that is supposed to be done by the individual governing council would also have to be played by the various governing council. So uh, when you check how the appointments are being made, onto the government council, you clearly realize that government or the Ministry of Education play the role of the external oversight responsibility as enshrined in tertiary education um, policy. Um, that was um, sanctioned by the Ministry of Education in 2018. And so, something, if I have to sum it uh, as my preliminary comment, um, the, the idea of government, or if you like, the Ministry of Education um, putting up such a bill uh, was to ensure that there is maximum oversight responsibility that is supposed to be played by the government and there should also be accountability on the part of the various university councils so if you like the um, university management that we have in our various universities because if you check the current act or statutes that governs the various universities now the act or the statute that governs the university of ghana is Different from what governs University of um, Vincent. Uh, uh, different from what governs v Vincent. University. Yeah, a couple of a couple of quick questions that I may get quick answers to. Right. Your emphasis is on accountability. Right. Now, is it the suggestion that by right. populating the council with the government representation appointment, so to speak? Right. Accountability will be achieved? Um, absolutely, yes. Um, reason be that when the management <laughs> of the university, finances. the management of the university, now, something, the management of the university that is supposed to be headed by the vice chancellor, so desires to go on to um, certain decisions by the management of the university, the only checks and balances that we could ensure that in instances that those decisions that are made by the management will not be to the benefit of the university and the Ghanaian populace at large. The only avenue that we have is at the governing council. And so the governing council is where government will have to populate its members to ensure that we do the checks and balances. I, I, now, if I, I don't get that logic. Representation, if, if the internal representation I, I is don't, one... I don't get that one, logic. One that that presently... Presently, the accounting systems exist in the universities 
The universities are audited. In fact, Parliament has a role. The Auditor General, not only the Auditor General, but Parliament has a role. All other state institutions are subject to this process of accountability by way of their financial management. You are saying that the way to achieve a better financial management or accountability is to have government representation dominating and hijacking the council? Well, I, I think that I would disagree with the word hijacking. No, we are not doing so. Um, if, if you could um, put, um, let me say, the um, leadership of management of the University of Ghana on the line, I was part of a meeting that transpired last year. Now, there was a loan and that was secured by the University of Ghana, I think somewhere in 2012, 2013, thereabouts, when Professor Yanka, the current Minister of um, um, Education, in charge of tertiary education, was at the university. In fact, I think he was even part of how the loan was secured. Now, fast forward about six, seven years, there is a default on the part of the University of Ghana as to how they pay. The University of Ghana is now finding it difficult to pay those amount of money. They now run back to government. So the point I'm making is, if government will now have to be the punching bag as, as, as far as um, certain decisions that were not at the benefit of the various universities were made, then why is it that the same government that is supposed to be at the receiving end of some of these mal decisions that are being made by the universities, that same government or that same Ministry of Education cannot have a say in whatever is being um, decided upon by the various um, university councils. So we are of the opinion that if we don't have a role to play mm. as far as the governing councils are concerned, and then whatever happened, um, for example, in the case of Kia University when there was that emergency, um, then it means that going forward we are going to have um, uh, problems or difficulties with the management of our various investors because if 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 there is a problem between student bodies and there is a um, with the um, management of the investors and government cannot have a rule or if you like there is a problem with the uh, SRC and the investor council who now becomes um, the 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 person or if you like the institution to be able to ensure that some of these things are regulated in in a manner so uh, we, we realize that as part of the reforms that we have to bring into the tertiary education sector it was adequate it was apt for the ministry of education to have maximum role mm. or to play a function you, that can be effective <laughs> effective okay. <laughs> effective oversight responsibility over the actions and inactions of the various university councils. And I see. We say that when you are making a law, you normally look for the mischief rule. What mischief is the law supposed to cure? The things you raise as mischief, you have been told that the way to go about them is not to bring a law that brings government directly into executive control of the governance of the university. If people are committing financial malfeasance in the university, if people are not sticking to the financial laws and regulations of this country, the laws are there to deal with them, is that not so? So why do you need this kind of introduction? You say this is a reform. Reforms are supposed to be the result of wide consultation between the stakeholders, among the stakeholders. Can you say this is the result, and yet there is this almost no approval from the universities, public universities? Uh, something. Um, I'm finding it difficult to understand um, where you are coming from. But the, the, the point that should be made is that government, through the Ministry of Education, or if you like the National Commission for Tertiary Education, at every point in time should ensure that in instances when there are challenges, as far as the administration of the various universities are concerned, will have to come. Now, if you check the acts and the statutes of the various universities, there are instances that the acts or statutes may be silent on how certain 
uh, how certain problems or how certain challenges are supposed to be um, dealt with as far as the investors are concerned. Now, if we have seen that the laws that governs the various investors are not meeting the present day administration of the various investors. For us as a government, for us as a Ministry of Education that have an oversight responsibility of all tertiary education that we have in this country, we decided through the tertiary education policy that we should bring about a harmonization or a standardization of all our laws that governs the various universities so that there is going to be a single reference document for University of Ghana, for Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, for University of Cape Coast, and all other public okay. universities. So I, I, so I, that I, yeah, just, uh, just, just, just maybe that some, everybody is some 30 seconds on this. In that particular, some 30 uh, seconds on this, and then I will get to uh, Professor Chia to deal with the question of academic freedom. Um, the, 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 this is where I am coming from, where you say you don't get. These universities have come together and they have done reviews of the law, of the intended law. I have read the reviews, even from the Ghana uh, Arts, uh, uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences, from the CDD, and clearly there is a complete rejection of the, of the bill in the manner that it is now. So that's where I'm coming from. They clearly suggest that this will stifle and slow their global competitiveness. Then, in talking about the academic freedom, what, how would you look at this situation? You have a council that is dominated by the government that can form a quorum. It is a council that determines questions of promotion among others. The universities have long ceased to be mere ivory towers. They are connected to our society. Teachers in the universities are speaking up about issues. Can you imagine any lecturer share a view that is critical of the government of the day when their promotion will be determined by the government's representatives? Um, Samson, what do we mean by academic freedom? Um, I will ask this question because for the first time in the history and analysis of this country, we have a document that defines what academic freedom is. Hitherto, I could not understand what we mean by academic freedom. Now, is there any part of the bill that is put forward um, to parliament that suggests that a university lecturer cannot go ahead with any research and the university council may have a problem with or without? Is there any part of the bill that shows that a lecturer, or if you like, a staff of the university, cannot do what he or she has been doing before the introduction of this bill? If there is none like that, then issues of academic freedom is one that is exaggerated, in my opinion, because academic freedom does not necessarily mean that the management or the leadership of the various universities could do whatever they want at every point in time. The questions you Academic have asked, freedom. the questions you asked before the answer are answered in the affirmative. I didn't get that. The questions you posed are answered in the affirmative. Is there anything in the bill that suggests that uh, uh, an academic's work, uh, research, might be stifled? Clearly, there, there is. Is there anything that suggests that they may not be able to exercise their freedom that they exercise presently? Clearly, there is. Well, um, Samson, I don't see that because if you check um, the section 43 of the current bill, um, which um, clearly talk about what academic freedom is, I don't see where there is any um, difficulty that is put or like it, a bar. Match it with 47. Match it with 47. And match it with the power of the of the minister to issue a directive that they must comply with. Samson, I heard you say that as soon as we say shall, it means mandatory. There, there, there is also a case in this country that means that the shall may not necessarily mean mandatory. Now, okay. the minister may not be acting in his person. Okay. The minister may be acting 
in or if you like on behalf of the government so when your panelists say that because the minister may not have the requisite knowledge to be able to ensure the um the, the, the policy um, the, the policy guidelines that is put forward by the minister. And for that matter, whatever the minister is putting out may not be on the basis of any professional advice. I disagree with that because if any minister, or if like the minister of education, as put out by the bill, suggests that the minister of education can bring out any policy direction, that would have to be adhered to, or if you like, um, obeyed by the various university. It is a government position, not the minister as a person. Okay. Because the minister has been appointed by the government yeah. and is supposed to be so the representative of the government. Control. So I don't think that when the minister yeah. is making any decision, right. um, so, so, it, it so exactly as you have said, ultimately, so that government can have maximum control. Please hang on there. We take a break. When we return, I commence with Professor uh, Etia on the question of academic freedom that you are beginning to understand by virtue of this bill. We'll be right back. You're welcome back. This is News File. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And we are looking at the matters of the uh, opposition to the Public Universities Bill, University Bill 2020. Um, uh, so let me take just about um, a minute or two comments from Professor Drew uh, as he takes leave of us. And then I come to uh, Professor Tia and uh, Admar Kwamov to give us the questions of academic freedom um, that we have to look at to conclude the discussion. Yeah, so Professor Drew, uh, what will be what will be your concluding comment, particularly having heard uh, from the government, uh, as represented by Vincent Ekoasefwa, Director of Communications of the Ministry of Education? Thank you very much, uh, I, I, I thank uh, Vincent, the director. One question comes up. I think it's important that the Minister of Education cannot have a say in what happens in the university. But it's suggesting that since 1998, when power was given to councils to take optimum decisions, ministers haven't had a say in the operations of universities. No. Ministers have had a say through the National Council of Tertiary Education. Ministers have had a say through the governing councils. You see, in principle, ministers must intervene when things are not going on well, but they must not interfere. That is what we want to avoid. And that's as interference is what the bill seeks to do. Okay. And that optimizes. The basic principles. Okay, so I you belong think, to the school that this I should be rejected think, outright. Yeah, outright. Okay. I think the major, the challenge we have in governance of our universities is with leadership and extreme politicization of university governance. Mm. These are two things that need to be addressed. Thank you very you see, much. Yeah. Parents, mm. If we have a minister who acts as a minister, then we can in some way say that academic freedom wouldn't be interfered with. But if you have a minister who acts as a party activist, that is where the danger is. Okay. But in Ghana, as I earlier said, when we talk about government representation, we are talking about political party representation. Hmm. So Samson, my recommendation, as I leave you start, one, uh, we, 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 we actually do not need a harmonized act and statutes to promote governance and management efficiency in public universities. What we need to address injustices and management inefficiencies in universities is to ensure that people appointed as vice chancellors Registrars are appointed on merits 
He appointed on merit, not on political lines. Mm. What we need to ensure is to make the regulatory bodies, NCTE and others, functional without okay. political interference. All right. And what we need to ensure is to ensure that the ministry operates on the basis of intervention but not on interference. As for the harmonized bill, mm. it is now starter. It okay. was rejected. Thank you, Thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Um, Professor George K.T. Odru is former Pro Vice Chancellor and current Dean, School of Educational Development and Reith Outreach, University of Cape Coast. Now, let's go to um, clause, is it uh, 43 of the Act, talking of, of the bill, talking about academic freedom. And what are your concerns about academic freedom? You seem to say from the reviews I have read that it will be lost. How so? Yes, it will be lost. And clearly, Mr. Asafuer's um, intervention uh, expressed that and confirmed that. What is it, first of all, before we he, talk about he, it being he lost? He seems to display uh, complete ignorance of the university governance system. And the university governance system operates on self-governance and institutional autonomy. And for that to work, the university is given some space which should not be encroached upon. That space is for a specific purpose. It's to promote what we call functional necessity of the university. So academic freedom here is a freedom that is, uh, has two dimensions with freedom from and freedom to. The freedom is for government not to respect the university space so that if there are certain rights that are there, it shouldn't seek to violate them. The government is also to protect the university against violations by third parties and if it so happens to ensure that that space is closed. The government is also has a duty to fulfill some obligations towards the investment in terms of provision of infrastructure and so on. And that is where the accountability issue comes in. Now there are laws, as have already been said, that seeks to regulate this. And one law which we, we, we want to mention is the Procurement Act under which the investment falls. So that we're talking about services, works, and so on, the the, um, the university has a responsibility to abide by the the, the both uh, the procedures and standards that are enshrined uh, uh, in the bill or the act to ensure that we don't overcome our, our we don't violate our uh, procurement rules that we have in the law. Now, academic freedom is to fulfil or to serve a public good. It is not given to the university academic or to the student just for that individual to enjoy. It is to be used to facilitate the realization of a good that will benefit the society as a whole. Now, if you look at clause 43, it talks about academic freedom for the institution and for academics. The one for the institutions, well put in terms of the, the content of it. The one for academics is not comprehensive. It only talks about the relationship between the university and the academics. And it says that the academic is protected from the enjoyment of the academic freedom by the university. What about the state itself? The state is the major duty bearer for academic freedom. And the state is mostly responsible for violating academic freedom. Now, that aside, all the, provision, the nice words in the definition of academic freedom for the university and for the academics, it, it is taken away through the clawback clause that we, 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 we have identified. The directive that the minister has violates invest, university autonomy. The president's power to uh, declare a state of emergency and, and to appoint um, the principal officers of the university, it violates academic freedom. It violates the institutional autonomy of the university. So um, we're talking about the freedom that academics should have to do research. It is tampered with because it has to go through these uh, irregularities and so on. Mm. Appointment mm. by the university council mm. is controlled. Yeah. So you, in that you, situation, we don't have academic yeah, freedom. Pro, 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 Professor Admokran Pofua suggested earlier whether if this comes in, you may want to stay back and not be as active as you could be. Uh, but why? 
if you have freedoms that are guaranteed by the Constitution already in Article 21, why would you be afraid because of this law? And the Ghana Arts and Science uh, Academy of Arts and Sciences say, academic freedom refers to the right that any academic has to research any relevant issues, present ideas and facts from their research to students and to the general public without fear of repression or censorship from their employers or any other person in authority. Such ideas or facts may sometimes be inconvenient for their employers or government, but they need to be protected as much as possible. Most universities around the world provide guidelines on the limitations imposed by common sense. So if this bill seeks to limit it a bit, why the fear? The fear is extremely uh, justified because now you are removing the protection that I have as a lecturer and a researcher and giving it to a government, which is political. And political parties come and go. Individuals remain in the institution. Individuals engage in research which can be political. Political in the sense that you are addressing issues that may be uncomfortable, that may be controversial, that may go against a particular party in office. So if I am seeking promotion, I'm not yet tenured, I'm a senior lecturer, mm. I'm applying to be associate professor, and I engage in research that um, seems to antagonize the government in power, and they have the majority on council, then it is likely that I will have the fear that my promotion will not come to pass or my promotion will be delayed because the council is representing a political entity. So I will either censure myself and not do that research, which is extremely dangerous. It means we are not going to be innovative, we're not going to be exciting, and it means that our students are also going to suffer because they will not get that learning in the classroom because we've not done the research mm. or because we are afraid to share it. They will also not do that research because they will be even more frightened that perhaps they will be failed. And, and we should remember that. This current bill gives the president the, the opportunity, the space to curtail and to intervene and to interfere mm. by creating state of uh, saying that there's an emergency. So imagine that the students, the SRC, mm. go on a demonstration. It is possible for government to interfere and mm. to have the SRC executives okay. um, I, I really would have wished to have uh, Vincent Tassefo have the last word, but we have run out of time. Unfortunately, you joined that a bit, uh, you joined that a bit too late, uh, but uh, I think that your preliminary views may have been all-encompassing as far as the bill is concerned. Uh, it's unfortunate. Uh, thank you very much. My guests have been uh, Professor Kosi Adumako Ampafu, Professor of African Studies and Acting Dean of International Programs, University of Ghana, Legon. Professor Kwejo uh, Apieje Etia, Associate Professor of Law, University of Ghana, Legon. Professor George. K.T. Odru, former Pro Vice Chancellor or, and current Dean, uh, Dean School of Educational Development and Outreach, University of Cape Coast. Professor Charles Marfo, who is the president of UTAC, national president. I apologize, uh, we couldn't get back to you also to have your views. Uh, your line was also tripping uh, a couple of times. Samuel Sego is the Grasak national president and earlier we spoke to Larry K. Agbado, editor, Colleges of Education Weekly Journal. And once again, thanks also to uh, Vincent Eko Asafua, Director of Communications, Ministry of Education. The consensus from the stakeholders as far as the universities are concerned on this platform is that this bill has to be jettisoned because they use many adjectives to describe it, retrogressive, unconstitutional, needless, solves nothing. My name is Samson Ladia Yanini. Have a good afternoon.